privilege to have a long-standing member of the BGC who has spent much time of his life pastoring churches and past being a pastor to the pastors as a district minister in Alberta and also training pastors as part of the Canadian Baptist Seminary. Cal Netterfield is currently the Director of, a develop, of Development at Canadian Baptist Seminary while also teaching Baptist history and thought. Cal has also pastored at the other Cedar Church in Surrey, um, Cedar Grove Baptist. So um, please join me in welcoming Cal Netterfield. We, we were in Alberta when uh, Brett Murdoch and Les and Verna Jean and the adventures began. And I know some of your history, the sorrows, the joys. Good to see you, Verna Jean, and some friends from Cedar Grove days. Uh, and of course, having my wife here is always wonderful. She has listened to me about 3,000 times, so she didn't... <laughs> She'll do a bit of a review afterwards. Sorry. We are grateful for the gospel, and I suppose that's the primary thanksgiving for me, is that as an 11-year-old boy, I, 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 I was confronted by Jesus. And uh, I wanted to do something for me. I, it was pretty practical. I wanted to go to heaven. I didn't want to go to hell, and that was a pretty good deal. And a little bit later, I discovered I also took nightmares away. And I have always believed that he was Savior since. I haven't always trusted me, but I've always trusted him. And I trust that will be our story today as we enter this Thanksgiving time. Now, you dear friends in the back row, are you there for some reason? Is that a fire escape exit? <laughs> <laughs> If you're done coffee, I want you to come up and sit in front. Jesus was confronted. And so do, do please join in. This is a this is a good thing. So just come on down. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, Wally says to continue to greet you. Uh, Wally is a dear friend and, and I'm grateful to be following him. And being concerned and praying for Jim is, is on our hearts as well. A bit about ourselves, Renee and I are, uh, I don't know what, what we call it. We're kind of in the November of our lives. I think October's past. November is that month before the last month. <coughs> but it's kind of, a, it's a great time too. Because we have some liberties. I did say to somebody the other day that our, our uh, retirement and our assignments are in conflict. And so this is one of the privileges of being this, this age is that you can have some retirement assignments. And so I'm grateful. Uh, CBS is a wonderful place to work with. Acts, Trinity Western, one of the great stories of Christianity in Canada is our very own Trinity Western University. And then they the umbrella of our seminaries, and especially we love our, our Acts and our CBS Canadian Baptist. Um, we have three children, ten grandchildren, and in the famous quote of Lake Wobegon, anybody know about Lake Wobegon? Where the children are just a little, the grandchildren are just a little above average. That was how they called it. And our kids, you know, grandkids, just a little above average. We love them. And I think they actually like us too, which is pretty good. I want to bring four messages in the next four Sundays, beginning today, on people Christ encountered in the book of John. And these have similarities and differences. I want to, I want to speak today on Nicodemus. The man who has everything, 
Want to talk about the woman at the well? The woman who has nothing? Want to talk about the man born blind from his birth, who had a very dim future? And then they started the outline. I want to talk about Pilate and his confrontation with Jesus. And uh, together we want to encourage this. Now, all of these have, have truths that are, are central to the, to the gospel. Each encounter has similarities. Each one of them is a, has a unique encounter truth about Christianity. And it's fascinating that in these encounters, you have dialogues with nobody else there. <coughs> have you ever wondered how John heard about these dialogues? How did, how did John hear about this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus? Ponder that. I'm not sure. But it's there. Uh, each of them came to seek something from Christ and, and went away with something else. Except for one, we don't know. Each one became a committed follower of Jesus. We don't know about what. And finally, I believe we can identify with each of these in, in a manner that will be life-changing. Let's pray together on a Thanksgiving Sunday for some of you who may have... I don't know. The Hoffs are not here, are they? They would remember this man who changed my life in Alberta. And he said, if you're ever preaching, Cal, pray for our leaders. His name was uh, Hugh McClure, medical doctor, missionary. And I want to pray for him us and our leaders today. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for thanksgiving, especially for Jesus, and then for those who you have called into leadership, whether it be political, cultural, medical, family, leadership, those who are kings and authorities over us. Just briefly, Father, I pray that there be some sort of sanity and grace that only you could, you could bring for our great neighbor to the south. For those who are in authority up over us, for Prime Minister Trudeau, for Mrs. Clark, all these, Lord, we ask that you would honor your request and bring a blessing even to the recognition, recognition of you, O oh Lord Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Nicodemus has a number of characteristics that assist us to identify who he is. Let me read this wonderful series of, of verses, paragraphs from John chapter 3. One of the dangers of preaching on a familiar passage is that we kind of think we know it all. And I get challenged that I don't know it all. And I trust that we'll be together in that maybe some awe today. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. 
You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then can you believe if I speak of heavenly things? <coughs> no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake, serpent, in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Do you want to share it together? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Oh my goodness. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what, has, that, that, that what he has done has been done through God. I have pondered John 3 for probably 60 years. And every time I come to it, it's like I haven't really understood it that way before. And today I come to you with this really significant awe that I've, I've found something new. And I want, I want this to be a, a morning for us together of discovery. This Nicodemus chap is, is a very attractive personality. He would have been elected easily to all of, almost all of the offices of British Columbia. He is, we know he's wealthy. Something about being wealthy is very attractive. Uh, we like wealth. We, we like to raise our heroes and we want wealth and you can tell it because it's an economic society. Everybody is involved with the pursuit of some level of security which comes by wealth, and Nicodemus had it. We know that because at the time of Jesus' death, he and Joseph, his friend of Arimathea, brought a hundred pounds of, of precious ointments that would have been the, the price of several years of, of income for us normal people. <laughs> this man had as well. Secondly, he was a, he was a Pharisee. The, the NIV, which I'm using today, says that he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. It would be equivalent to the, the House of Lords in England, or uh, more than the Senate in Canada. <laughs> it, would have been, it would have been the House of the Jewish Lords. They were the keepers of the culture. They were the keepers of Israel. They, I believe, had been raised up following the Maccabean revolutions to, to keep Israel on track and not let them go again into idolatry. These were noble people. Now, they get a bad name because they got into such nobility that they wanted everybody else to feel bad. We've known people like that from time to time. So righteous you can't be around them. <laughs> Sticky. Ooh. Let that not be of us. <laughs> that was Nicodemus. He had taken the pledge to spend the rest of his life observing and defending and detailing the law. 
the wonderful law of the first five books of the Bible, the law given by Moses, which was life-giving. I love your law, O Lord. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits with the seat of the scornful, but he delights daily in the law of God. This was, this was beautiful, and he was committed to it. He was a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, the court of 70, the Supreme Court overseeing especially potential blasphemy. He didn't want anybody messing with the truth. You know, it's not, it's interesting. It's not, it's not surprising that Islam has within it this similar form of exactitude. And if you mess with Muhammad, it's blasphemy. Just, this, was, this was similar. And without Jesus, that would be very similar. And yet, Jesus becomes attractive to him. He is compelled to come to see Jesus. And it's historically believed as well that he was a member of a royal family. A Mayflower family. <laughs> At least I did not know you were so significant. Well, I knew you were. But. <laughs> he was a member of what would be called the Maccabean heritage. The Maccabeans, the brothers, had delivered Israel some 200 and some years before, and they were heroes, and he was a member of that. And then there's reference, too, that his son becomes an ambassador of Rome to Pompey. It's, a minister, it's an interesting story of his life, and he's attracted to Jesus. One concludes, first of all, if you're taking points, number one, Jesus is attractive. Number two, Jesus is confronted. And number three, Jesus really does save. And that's enough to be thankful for. So, number one, Jesus is compelling. Such a compelling person that the ruler of the Jew, Jews, someone who was always <coughs> having people come to him, goes to Jesus. I don't know if you can identify with that. All of us have pecking orders in our lives. There's people we look up to and people we look down on. Right? Come on, you can be truthful with me. <laughs> Not many people did Nicodemus look up to. And I think he's compelled because there's something about Jesus that they can look up to. Do you have anybody you really look up to? This will be a compelling, compelling magnet that you can look up to Jesus. Jesus is attractive. He was attractive by several things. We know about them. But the primary attractivity to Nicodemus was his signs, miraculous signs, signs and wonders. Can you remember some of them? What did he do? He had the best wine in the Palestinian continent. That, that was an amazing thing. Turn water to water. What else? <coughs> Heal the blind. I wrote down just 15 or so of them. Walked on water. Delivered people from demonic activity. Um, storms were still. Fig trees were blasted. Faith was given. Kingdom was introduced. People felt genuine love. People experienced the foretaste of the kingdom of God. Healings, deliverance. Where Jesus came, there was change. And Nicodemus saw this and he wanted to know what it was all about. One of the, one of the absolute truths of the life of the church is that it must be significant, it must matter. It must have signs and wonders of God's presence and activity among it. Your story is this morning of healing. Amen. The greatest story is the changed life. The greatest story is that I have, I've been raised with Christ. My life has been changed. 
uh, for 2,000 years. It's equivalency today. Is that Christ continues to be the most compelling person in the universe. He is the standard of truth. He is the standard of life. He is the standard of light. Do you believe that? I believe you do. Embrace it. Embrace him. He's compelling. My own story, your story, must have an equivalent Nicodemus dimension to it. Can you, can you tell your own story when you were curious about him, when you were drawn to him, when you went to him, when you went to him probably with your own agenda, and he changed your agenda, and he gave you his agenda? <laughs> Do you remember the story in your own life? Tell it again to yourself. He's compelling. He draws you. He wants you to come to him. And Nicodemus did. Um, and you know that there's so many other people around us. There's likely somebody in your family right now, in your network, in your oikos, that is, that is attracted to Jesus. Maybe a system like Andrew did to come. Let Jesus do the work. Just remember that it's not me that does any saving. It's not you that does the saving. He does it. Jesus is hugely, wonderfully, dangerously attractive. Dangerously, by the way. He will, he will mess up your life. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. You will not be the same. And you know that. If, by the way, you think life is bland, just go to him again. He'll change your head. Secondly, I see that in this text, although he's attractive, he's also very confrontive. The idea that the church must be some bland cultural chaplaincy is bogus. We are not chaplains of the status quo. We should, like the church did in Ephesus, cause either a riot or a revival. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Say right that on. again. Amen. <laughs> that is the standard where the gospel is really effective. I will tell, I'll tell you just... <laughs> now make sure it's the gospel you're causing headlines over. <laughs> Not scandal. Don't, don't, don't do that. The world will find scandal quick enough. Lift Jesus higher Amen. and you'll be in trouble. <laughs> that's, that's what Jesus is doing here. And uh, be creative. Pray about something that will irritate culture. Do that. For, for Christ's sake. He's irritating. He is irritating Nicodemus for kingdom purposes. He, he shatters the category of this wonderful human being who comes to him on equal ground with respect, and immediately Jesus confronts him with everything that he believes as being bogus. The law is not good enough. You, you, have, to, you, have, to, you have to be born again, Nicodemus. Huh. A carpenter's son with questionable pedigree, not sure who his father was, and an unclean lifestyle, he can't even keep his disciples from eating on the wrong day at the wrong time with the wrong purposes. An unclean kind of guy, and known as a, as a, as a glutton and a wine bibber, telling the cream of the crop of Israel <laughs> that he's got to do something. <laughs> now that takes jam. <laughs> I don't know. Don't I wish we all had it. <laughs> I like you already. <laughs> uh, he says, my spiritual lifestyle, the core of my self-righteousness will send me to hell. In me there is no good thing, and he tells that to Nicodemus. In you, sir, with all your pride, you are in serious trouble. And so the very elite of culture is pegged. 
And so I argue with him as Nicodemus does and cultural culture argues with us. You have no right to say that to us, he declares. No, no raised voices, no qualifiers, no you're a wonderful leader, no warning, no warm up. He just says, Nicodemus, the greatest thing in the world is you're lacking it. You're lacking a new and spiritual birth that unless you have it, you will never see the kingdom of God. And then he repeats it again, unless you are born again, born from above, born by the wind, born by the breath, born by the spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Uh, it tells me the kingdom of God is about life, about second life, about spiritual reign in me is the man for my surrender is without equivocation. Have you done that? Have I done that? Ask. Tell me your own story again. Tell me when. Tell me when the wind blew and you were saved. Hallelujah. August 16, 1993. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Don't be afraid of that. That's your story. No, I was raised a Christian. <laughs> and it comes often with the signs that came with Nicodemus. Later on, we find him standing for Christ, and then at the trans and his, his, his Savior's death, he stands there against the flow, against the Sanhedrin, and gives himself over to Christ. It's repentance of a lifestyle, and welcome of the wind. But what about everything I've been taught? What about my original birth, my pedigree, all my things that I can truck out? This second business, birth business is strange. It's too out of my control. It's fascinating. He is, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. What a picture. He's, he's using hyperbole here. He's saying this is nonsense. This can't happen. And then Jesus goes back to the first son of man, Ezekiel. He reminds Nicodemus that God said to, Nick, to, to Ezekiel, let the wind blow on those dry bones. <coughs> Ezekiel 37, 8 and 9. Let the wind blow on those bones. Will they live again? Yeah. And then we have the knee bone connecting to the thigh bone, the thigh bone connecting. <laughs> And the rattling goes on and life comes back. And that's for you, that's for me. You want to live, really live. Let the wind blow, let the spirit come. You're born of water, you've got to be born of the spirit. That's what we say. The water, that's your mama. It's the flow of water. And there's a hint there of baptism too. I don't want to get into that today, that could be a little troublesome to some, but I've never seen a believer that didn't want to be baptized. <coughs> and that's part of the story. Let the wind blow. Let life come. Be born of the Spirit. <clears throat> Don't be surprised that Jesus asks you some tough things. And especially to Nicodemus. Come and leave everything you've known come to me. Um, thirdly, lastly, Nicodemus and thee and me discover and find ultimately that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Beginning really at verse 14, because Moses lifted up the snake Serpent in the, in the wilderness of the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. In this story, he's recounting. Do you remember Numbers? Remember some of that? You ever been back in the Old Testament for a while? Numbers got some great, great stuff. Numbers has a story where the children of Israel, the foreshadow of the church, are grumbling. Churches have never grumbled, have they? 
Have you ever heard of a church that's grumbling? <laughs> they were grumbling that God had not done enough for them, that he'd taken them out of Egypt where they had, they had the greatest social welfare system and all their medical supplies were handled and everything was great. Well, not really because they had forgotten. They had selective memory. Anyway, they were grumbling. And so God in his gracious judgment brings fiery serpents into their midst. <sighs> I'm glad we live in the New Testament and the Covenant. But he did that. And they were being, they were being decimated as a people. And uh, God spoke to Moses and said, take one of those snakes and, and make, make a figure of a, of a brass snake and wrap it around a post and stick it in the ground and tell the people of God, people of Israel, to look at the, at the brass snake. And when they look, they'll be healed. They'll be restored. The story goes on. They actually did that. And most of them were restored and healed <coughs> and delivered. And they went on to take history into the promised land. Um, any of you in the medical field? You know the medical side? It's the, it's the snake on the post. Right from there. When you look, you'll be healed. Okay? Jesus says, Just as Moses lift up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Are you, are you getting what I'm getting here? Do you, what, do you see what Jesus is saying? The Son of Man is identified with the serpent here. Who's the serpent? No. Satan. Satan. The one who, who poisoned mankind. Come to, come to Golgotha. Come to Calvary. Who's on the cross? Oh, it's Jesus, the Lamb of God. Yes, but what had, he, what had he done? He had taken on the curse of mankind upon him. He had taken upon him the poison of sin. He who knew no sin became sin for me, for us. And I could become him. What a transaction. Thank you, Lord. Where are your sins? On the cross. Got to be on him or you're going to die without him. Transaction. And how does that take place? Same way it happened for Israel. Look at the cross. Don't, don't look at your sin anymore. Look at the snake. Look at Jesus, the awful Jesus, the magnificent Jesus. All at the same time. No greater love has any man than this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to become sin for me. You have DVDs of your sin? took it. He's the Savior. Uh, one last thing. He's the magnet for the whole world. He's the magnet. When I am lifted up, when the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw all men to me. That means on the cross, on the glorious cross, on the awful cross, he draws people. Have you seen it? Seen it in your own life? I have a good friend, Tom Peach. I don't know. Do you remember Tom? Have you ever heard his story? He's telling me his story these days. It's absolutely incredible. 
He was at the top of his game in the, in the law, in the, in the field of law, in Burnaby. Elected to public office. Between a divorce, an attempted suicide of his son, his own emotional distress, he crashed. And he absolutely fell apart. And some guys that hear from Abbotsford, one of his clients came to him one day in his misery and said, would you, like, would you let me tell you about Jesus Christ? Across the desk. And Tom said, I, I began to weep. I had no idea this was coming. I started weeping. Across the desk of a law office, he gave his life to Christ. What's your story? It, it doesn't need to be that dramatic. I'm just fascinated by it. When we look at Jesus, what did he do for you? Even as he was, the healing, by, oh, by the way, just to say about healing, physical healing is always a precursor to what he wants to do in your inner kingdom. The healing is not the big thing. Healing is good. It may not be. Do you know that, I'll be tongue in cheek for a moment, I just want to say that people who believe in healing and people who don't believe in healing have exactly the same lifespan. <laughs> God, be careful. We don't, don't make healing too big a deal. It's what he wants to do in your life. That's the big deal. And so, people who want to be healed look to the cross for God so loved the world. God is a generous God. And he's this magnet that he wants all men to believe. But what we hear in this last chapter, just in this last few verses, not, not to extend along, but he attracts those who want to come, and he repels those who want to stay in darkness. And magnets also repel as well as attract. Yeah. We've got to remember that. There will be some who will say no to the breaking of our hearts. But all the glory of people and the glory of Christ and the glory of the church can <coughs> you say yes. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for Thanksgiving Day and for the magnificence of the Savior. Thank you that he's attractive and confrontive and saving in Jesus' name.